Let's turn now in our Bibles to the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. In the third chapter, Paul began the chapter with the words, for this, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. He begins the fourth chapter, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Now, though he was in a prison in Rome, he did not consider himself a prisoner of Rome or of the Roman government. He considered himself a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he was there in prison because of his preaching and of his teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. So a prisoner of the Lord. And I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. So as Paul now enters into this portion of the book, he's going to be dealing with the walk of the believer. And the first thing he exhorts is that we walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we were called. What have we been called? We've been called to be saints. We've been called to be the children of God through faith. We've been called to be the heirs of salvation. So walk worthy as a child of God, as an heir of God, as a saint of God. Walk worthy of the calling wherewith you've been called. And then he describes how we are to walk. In verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness. There is really no place for pride in the Christian walk. In fact, a person who is proud is a person who has not yet met the Lord. They may know about the Lord. They may profess knowing the Lord. But you cannot have a true encounter with God and remain a proud person. When Isaiah had an encounter with God, chapter 6, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. Then said I, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. Daniel, when he spoke of his experience with God, declared that he was, his beauty turned into ugliness. Peter, when he had a real encounter with the Lord, he said, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. And a person who has had a true encounter with God, how could you be proud? There's no way. So we are to walk in all lowliness and meekness. We're not to be lifted up or try to be lifted up or elevate ourselves or walk around in a, uh, you know, sort of, uh, strut kind of a thing, you know. But we're to walk in lowliness and meekness, long-suffering and forbearing, even as God has been long-suffering. And of course, one of the characteristics of the agape love, it suffers long and is kind. Forbearing one another in love, you got to put up with me in love, forbearing one another in love. And I've got to put up with you, and I don't know which has the biggest problem, but uh, we are to forbear one another in love. And uh, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, Satan wants to cause division within the body of Christ, and he has done a pretty good job. We look at how the body of Christ has been divided and fractured. But we should endeavor 
to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So when Paul tells us to walk worthy, this is how we are to walk. Endeavoring to keep this unity that we have in Christ. For there is only one body and one spirit. Now, I dedicated a church in Arlington, Texas this past week, a new Calvary Chapel there. And the pastor of the Calvary Chapel there was formerly a uh, member of the Church of Christ. In fact, he was an elder in one of the Church of Christ churches. But he said that he was one of the strictest of the Church of Christ. In fact, the 35 people that were meeting together had determined that the rest of the Church of Christ were actually more liberal and they doubted whether or not they were really saved. He said, we had come to the conclusion that we were the only ones that really walked in the truth. The whole rest of the body of Christ was in error. And we 35 were probably the only ones that were going to make it to heaven. He said, you don't know how narrow we were. <laughs> and he started listening to our studies on the radio as we were in the book of Romans and talking about the grace of God. And God began to open his eyes to realize that there are other people who love the Lord who weren't a member of their 35. And uh, as God began to open up his eyes to the truth of the grace of God, it was like a revelation to him. And so he finally uh, started a Calvary Chapel there in Arlington, Texas, and God has been blessing him and his ministry. But it is sad that uh, there are so many segments and divisions within the body of Christ, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. But there are so many who are ready to divide over almost any issue. And yet there is only one body and we are all a part of that one body of Christ. And God help us that we might uh, really uh, recognize this and realize this. I had a wonderful time this past week uh, m w fellowshipping with a couple of pastors from Costa Mesa a Lutheran pastor and a Baptist pastor. And they are looking into the merging of their two churches. Now that's exciting to me. A Baptist Lutheran, you know, or a Baptist <laughs> Baptist or whatever you would call it. But the merging of the two churches that they might have a stronger witness that they might have a larger Christian school and by, that they just might work together and to me it was an exciting thing to talk to them about this possible merger that they're praying about and and the congregations are considering and I encourage them there's only one body you know, as far as the Lord, he doesn't look at, you know, the name on the door if we're Presbyterians or Lutherans or Baptist or, or Methodist or whatever. That is immaterial to him. There's one body, and that's the body of Christ. There's only one person who can really say, my church, and that's Jesus. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. He's the only one who can say, my church. And the glorious thing about his church is you can't join it. You've got to be born into it. 
And everyone who is born of God is in the one body. And the sooner we can recognize that, the better. The walls come down. And as we talk about the one body of Christ, if one member suffers, they all suffer. If one is exalted, they're all exalted. And that is why it is so absolutely wrong for us to sort of gloat or feel, you know, sort of satisfied in a sense when someone stumbles and someone falls, uh, a church or a pastor. When one suffers, they all suffer. When one is exalted, and it's so wrong to be jealous when God is moving in a church, in, in the area or community, and, and God is really blessing them. It's wrong to feel a sense of jealousy because when one is exalted, they're all exalted. And we need to really see the oneness of the body of Christ, one body, one spirit even as you are called in one hope of your calling. Now, there are not seven heavens, one for the Baptist and one for the Lutheran, and, you know, not separate segments in heaven. There's just one hope of our calling, and that's to be with our Lord forever. And there we'll have to mix. Well, we might as well get started now. And we might as well recognize now that when we get there, it's going to be just one big, happy family of God. And no one's going to be asking you about what denominational affiliation did you have. That won't be important. There's just one hope of our calling. There's only one Lord and one faith, and one baptism. It's so sad, there are churches that will not accept the baptism of another church. Uh, if you've been baptized in uh, a, a church and you want to gain membership in another church, uh, there are many churches that will not accept your baptism if you weren't baptized into the church of Jesus Christ. And so they require another baptism. You've got to be baptized into the church of Christ. And that's sort of sad. It's interesting, the one issue that's come up with the merger of the Lutherans and the Baptists is the Baptists believe in uh, baptism by full immersion, and of course the Lutherans sprinkle for the most part. So they're wondering, and, and this Baptist church has a rule that you have to be baptized by full immersion. So what do we do with all of the Lutherans that will be joining us who are sprinkled? And that's one of the issues they're working through, and they're talking about sort of a grandfather clause. Uh, <laughs> that they can accept the Lutherans if you were sprinkled, fine, you know, and, and they're ready to accept that and uh, to uh, recognize that there's only one baptism and whether or not it was by dunking or by sprinkling or uh, forwards or backwards or whatever, that one baptism. Baptized by the Spirit into the body of Jesus Christ. There's only one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. He's everything. He's above all, he's in all of us, and it is uh, through all things, one God. So, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, because we're one. There's only one Baptism, one church, one Lord, and one calling, one God, one faith. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Oh, how I love this passage of Scripture. God has given to each one of us grace, his unmerited favor, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. 
To the church in Rome, Paul wrote in chapter 8 that what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. That's grace. God spared not his own son, delivered him up for us all. How much more then shall he not freely give us all things? God has given us grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. What Paul is saying is that God has already given the most. Anything that you may desire, anything that you may need, pales in uh, comparison with what God has already given. The grace of God according to the measure of the gift of Christ. He gave the best for us in giving his son. And anything that we might need just is nothing in comparison with that grace that God has bestowed through the gift of his son. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men, gifts according to his grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And now he has given to the church gifted men. Now, there are gifts of the Holy Spirit, manifestations and gifts of the Spirit that Paul speaks about in Romans uh, chapter 12 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But now he's talking about ministry gifts. The ministry gift of an apostle. The ministry gift of a prophet and of an evangelist and of pastor teachers so to every one of us is given grace wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high he led the captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men and now that he ascended what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth now he's talking about the ascension of jesus and of course he is quoting from psalm 68 18 and uh that is an interesting prophetic psalm uh, concerning uh, the Lord. And Paul is quoting it here uh, where the psalmist said, Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, and thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. So, uh, Jesus has ascended, but Paul says he first of all descended into the lower parts of the earth. The Pharisees one day asked Jesus for a sign that he was the Messiah. He said, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks after signs, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. When Jesus died on the cross, his soul descended into hell, into Hades. And he was there for three days and for three nights. Now, prior to the death of Jesus, Hades was divided into two compartments. And in Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, Jesus talks about Hades, the two compartments. He said there was a certain rich man who fared sumptuously. And moreover, there was a poor man that was brought daily and laid at his gates, begging bread. And moreover, the dogs came and licked the poor man's sores. 
And the poor man died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and in Hades, in hell, lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeing Lazarus afar off, comforted in Abraham's bosom, called and said, Father Abraham, I pray, send Lazarus unto me, that he may dip his finger in water and touch my tongue, for I am tormented in this heat. Abraham said, Son, remember that you in your lifetime had the good things and Lazarus the evil. Now he is comforted while you are tormented. But beside this, there is a gulf that is fixed between us and it's impossible for those that are on this side to come over there or those that are on that side to come over here. Can't send him over. There's this gulf that's fixed. And there's... Now, the rich man was in torment. He was suffering. Lazarus was with Abraham being comforted in Abraham's bosom. Now, it was impossible in the Old Testament with the sacrifices of the goats and the bulls to put away sin. It covered sin, but it didn't put away sin. And thus, those in the Old Testament period when they died could not enter into heaven because their sins were only covered, not put away. It took the blood of Jesus Christ to put away our sins. And thus, those in the Old Testament all died in faith, we are told in Hebrews chapter 11, not receiving the promise, but seeing it afar off. They held on to it, and they claimed that they were just strangers and pilgrims here on this earth, and they were looking for a city the city of God, which hath foundation, whose maker and builder is God. And we are told in the last part of Hebrews 11, concerning these men of faith, they all died in faith, not having received the promise, God having reserved some better thing for us, that is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that they without us could not come into the perfected state. So when Jesus died, his soul went into hell. And there we are told in Peter, he preached to the souls that were in prison. Now, when he ascended, he led the captives from their captivity. In the 61st chapter of Isaiah, the prophecy concerning the Messiah, it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those that were bound. And so Jesus descended into hell, into that compartment where Abraham was comforting those who died in faith assuring them that God would keep his promise. And when Jesus descended into hell, you can be sure that there was a glorious celebration as he announced that the redemption had been finished. As he cried on the cross, it is finished. The price of man's redemption and thus when Jesus ascended he led the captives from their captivity we are told in Matthew 27 that the graves of many of the saints were open and they were seen walking in the streets of Jerusalem after his resurrection from the dead they were set free from the prison he led the captives from their captivity and so he who has ascended is the one who first of all descended into the lower parts of the earth. Now, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the church and people gathered because of the phenomena that was taking place, when Peter stood up to preach to them the message of Jesus Christ, he 
announced his subject, Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was proved to be of God by the signs and the wonders which he did in the midst of you, who you, according to the uh, determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, with your wicked hands have crucified and slain, but God has raised him from the dead because it was not possible that he could be held of it. For David prophesied of him, saying, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will you allow the Holy One to see corruption. And so Peter said, We testify to you that God did not leave his soul in hell, neither did he allow the Holy One to see corruption. But this same Jesus hath God raised from the dead. So Paul tells us, He who has ascended is the same one who first of all descended into the lower parts of the earth and when he ascended he led the captivities captive and he gave gifts unto men that is unto the church and to some well he that descended the same as he that ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things and he gave some apostles some prophets some evangelists and some pastor teachers for what purpose? For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. The purpose of the church is for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. You see, God has called all of you to serve him, to serve him in some capacity or another. We have been called of God to serve. The purpose of the church is to perfect you for that place of service that you might fulfill the ministry that God has called you to fulfill. The word minister means a servant. We've all been called to serve. And thus, the purpose of our gathering together, the purpose of God giving to me the gift of pastor teacher is that we might perfect you for the work of the ministry that you might be able to fulfill that calling of God and that service to which God has called you that which God would have you to do for him for the building up of the body of Christ. We gather in order that we might be built up in Christ, that our faith might be built up, that our relationship with the Lord might be built up, that you might become strong in the things of the Spirit and in the things of the Lord, the building up of the body of Christ. For years, the early years of my ministry, most of my sermons were evangelistic sermons because I believed that the primary purpose of the church was the evangelization of the world. And thus, I was preaching evangelistic sermons. It was not until I made a careful study of Ephesians that I came to the conclusion that the purpose of the church is to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry and to build up the body of Christ. Now, the problem of evangelistic sermons is that the people didn't grow or mature spiritually. I kept them in a state of spiritual infancy in that we were always preaching sermons on repentance from sin, the necessity of being baptized, and uh, the, the first principles of the doctrine of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 6 it said, therefore laying aside the first principles, the primaries, the, the, let's go on into full maturity. But I wasn't taking the people beyond the message of salvation. And as a result, I was preaching salvation to people who were saved. Going over and over again, the necessity of being born again, the necessity of being forgiven of your sins, the 
necessity of being baptized in water, but I wasn't taking them on into maturity in Christ. And thus they were kept in a state of spiritual infancy. And I was preaching the church to death. And unfortunately, many churches have been preached to death. But they haven't been taught. They've never gone beyond the first principles. And they've never been taught. And the real need in the church is the solid systematic exposition or teaching of the scriptures that there might be growth beyond the first principles of the doctrines of Christ. Let's go on into perfection. So the perfecting of the saints, the building up of the body of Christ, until we all come into the unity of the faith, into the knowledge of the Son of God, that we might come to a understanding of what we have through Jesus Christ more than just the forgiveness of sins, more than just salvation, but we have the power of God's Spirit to live as God would have us to live. And we, we begin to understand what it is to have Christ in you as the hope of glory. And the transforming power of God's Spirit transforming us into the image of Jesus Christ and going on into these other things that, that we might be perfected or come into a full maturity. And so till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a fully matured man. The word perfect there in, in the Greek uh, speaks of full age or fully matured. Now Paul, writing to the Corinthians, said that they were babes in Christ. They weren't able to take meat. He had to give them milk. And even at the present time, they were still not able to take the meat of the word. And so here he speaks to them of uh, the uh, coming into the knowledge of the Son of God into a full maturity in Jesus Christ. And oh, how we long for that full maturity, that we not be babes, but we grow up and become mature. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's the kind of maturity that God wants to bring us to, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, to be like Jesus. That is the purpose of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and we all with unveiled faces, as we behold the glory of the Lord, are being changed from glory to glory into the same image by his spirit that's dwelling in us. And so Paul is talking here of coming into full maturity and Jesus is the measure. He is the model that God is using as he is forming and shaping your life. Sometimes we wonder, God, just what are you doing? As he begins to chip away at some of the old nature and, Lord, what are you doing? Well, he's, he's making you into the image of Jesus. And he's knocking off the rough edges. And, and he's, he's looking at the model. Jesus is the model and he's seeking to form you into that model. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doesn't yet appear what we're going to be, but we know when he appears, we're going to be like him. For we will see him as he is. And so, God working in us by his spirit, bringing us into that full maturity, into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth, be no more children, not be a baby any longer, who is tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. 
Throughout the church, there are many winds of doctrine that blow over the church. They are spiritual fads. And people follow after them. They chase after them. They're the latest spiritual fad or the latest spiritual craze. And, and people begin to chase after these spiritual fads as they're looking for some kind of exotic spiritual experience. And they're carried about with every wind of doctrine, vacillating, unstable, whatever direction the wind is blowing, whatever new concept or idea comes along. But Paul points out that so many of these winds of doctrine are being promoted and promulgated by the slight of men and cunning craftiness of these men who are lying in wait to deceive. There was a Bible teacher from England who came to the United States and he began teaching that Christians could be demon-possessed and he started having meetings in which the Christians were supposedly being delivered from demon possession. And they would actually sort of vomit up these demons. They'd go through sort of a, you know, a... a, a, a contraction or whatever and begin to sort of vomit up and so they would pass out Kleenexes so that the people could vomit the demons and so they would go through the you know and <laughs> then they'd say you know they, they vomited up this green thing in the Kleenex and when they opened up the Kleenex, would you believe there was nothing there? Yes, I would. <laughs> now, this Bible teacher was questioned about this. And his rationale for doing it was that you have to have a gimmick. Because if you're just a Bible teacher you won't gain any notoriety. So you need some kind of a gimmick to draw the crowd so that they can listen to the teaching of the word. Well, that's exactly what Paul is talking about here. The cunning craftiness, the sleight of men, that is sleight of hand kind of stuff, the cunning craftiness where they develop some gimmick to draw the crowd. And so you find that these men all have their little gimmick, whether it be slain in the spirit or whether it be severe physical shaking or whether it be fall, you know, or whether it be uncontrollable laughter or making animal noises or whatever they need some kind of a gimmick to draw that crowd that is looking for the spectacular kind of an experience and so children tossed to and fro why because they haven't been taught in the word they don't have a solid foundation. You know, to me, it's, it's great that when these men with their gimmicks come into the area, 
it has absolutely no effect upon our church. Why? Because you're no more children. You've been taught in the world, word and you have a basic foundation in God's truth and, and you've grown up. And thus, you are not deceived by every wind of doctrine. You're not chasing after all of these things because we have the foundation of God's word and we're established in that. But children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But in contrast to this, we should speak the truth in love that we might grow up into him in all things and so often i i feel like just saying to people grow up man you know they come and they tell of some exotic meeting that they've been in and usually they're sort of new believers and someone has invited them to some meeting where things are and they come and they're all oh my you know and i think i, I just feel Grow up. You know, that stuff that's been going around and being recycled over the years. There's nothing new about that. That's, you know, just uh, gimmicks to attract people's attention. We need to just speak the truth of God. Speak it in love. Now that's, some people are speaking the truth but not in love. Uh, they are uh, speaking it in, in a critical way. And uh, they're always seeking to find fault. But we are to speak the truth in love. That we might grow up into Jesus, into him, in all things which is the head, even Christ. Jesus Christ is the head of the body, the church. So he said, from whom the whole body is fitly joined together. It is Jesus who places us in the body. And as I said, we've all been called to serve, and thus we all have a place in the body and Jesus places us in the body. He fitly joins us together. Now, not all parts of the body have the same function. Each part of the body has its own distinct function. And one of the problems is trying to be something that God didn't make us. As for years, I tried to be an evangelist, which God didn't make me. He put me in the body as a pastor teacher. And it took years in the ministry for me to come to this. If you are an eye in the body of Christ, so to speak, then it would be very difficult for you to grip something. Try to be a hand. I don't like being an eye. I want to move things. <laughs> or if God's called you to be a hand, it's awfully hard then to be an eye. I want to see things, you know. <laughs> Jesus fitly joins us together. And we each have our place, and it's important that we each fulfill the place that God has put us in the body. Elsewise, the body isn't functioning fully. The body is crippled because you are not taking and fulfilling that place in the body where the Lord has placed you. We are fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, every part working effectually, every part doing its part and being strengthened and being directed by the head. Even as our bodies are being directed by the brain 
and the brain marvelously directs the functions of the body so that we move and we can walk and we can reach things and we can uh, do so many things uh, because the brain is directing the whole function of the body. Now, if my hand doesn't want to obey the instructions from the brain and I want to pick up an object and my hand is rebelling it says I don't want to pick that up so my brain gives instructions to pick up my keys and my arm and my muscles react to the message from the brain, but the hand says, no way. <laughs> Don't want to do it. Then, you see, the function is breaking down because one part of the body isn't functioning in obedience to the head. It's sort of sad. It's, it's, it's wonderful the way the brain does coordinate the actions of the muscles and the uh, tendons and so forth uh, that you can reach out in a smooth, coordinated way. You don't... <laughs> but yet you look at the body of Christ and that's... It's spastic. <laughs> and it's tragic that there, there's so much, I want to do it my way. No, I don't like that. No, I won't do that. And, and thus, Paul is talking about the body being fitly compacted together. Every joint being supplied according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, every part effectually working together, that it might make increase of the body to the edifying of itself in love. So the body is built up in love, but it takes us all working together as Jesus, the head of the body, gives the direction as he places us in the body, as he gives us the ability and the strength and all to fulfill that part in the body of Christ where he would have me to be. This I say, therefore, and testify. So Paul's going to go on to another subject now. As he, this is all walking worthy. Now he's going to tell us that we are to walk. I testify, therefore, in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not this is a negative now that you walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds he's talking about the Gentile world and he is saying that they walk in the emptiness of their minds empty headed their lives do not make sense they are not rational in their decision making they're walking in the emptiness of their minds because their understanding is darkened the understanding of God the understanding of spiritual things and they are alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them it's interesting to me how so many people speak in such a knowing way of God and yet are so totally ignorant of God. The Gentiles. You're not to walk as they walk in the emptiness of their minds. Their understanding is darkened. They're alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. 
One day Jesus said, if the blind lead the blind, they will both fall in the ditch. But it's amazing how many blind people are leading other blind people. The New Age movement how ignorant they are of the truth of God. And yet how many people are following the blind leaders of the New Age movement. Paul goes on to describe them as being past feelings. They don't have natural inhibitions anymore. They've seared their conscience. They do things that the scriptures prohibit, but they're not embarrassed about it. They talk openly about it, almost boasting about it as they appear on the TV talk shows and so forth and, and talk about the corrupt, filthy lifestyles. And, and they're sort of being promoted on these TV programs. And, and they're... You know, people are applauding them because of their uh, willingness to break the bonds of uh, decency. And being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. And of course, at the bottom of so much of it is greed. Uh, so all of your pornography, what's the bottom line? Greed. Prostitution, what's the bottom line? Greed. The drug trade, what's the bottom line? Greed. And so they're working all uncleanness with greediness. But Paul says, you have not so learned Christ. That's not what you've been taught. You've not so learned Christ. If so be that you've heard of him and have been taught by him because the truth is in Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Pilate said in a cynical way, what is truth? And today, men are asking, what is truth? In the college philosophy departments, the big question is, what is truth? And they have concluded that truth does not exist. That truth is only relative. But Jesus is truth. You've been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And what is the truth? That we need to put off Concerning our former manner of life, the old man, the old nature, the Adamic nature, we need to put that off, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Our old Adamic nature is governed and ruled by our body needs and desires. The body drives. Uh, Alexander Maslow has identified some 11, I think it is, body drives. And the old nature, the old man, is controlled by these body drives. That's why Jesus said that the Gentiles are seeking after what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear. He said, after these things, the Gentiles are worried. But you, if you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all of these other things will be added to you. In other words, they will fall into place. It isn't that I don't eat, I become an ascetic, but it doesn't master me anymore it isn't the most important thing in my life any longer it doesn't mean that I don't have sex it means that sex doesn't rule over me 
It isn't mastering over my life any longer. And I have it within the prescribed scriptural confines. One woman for one man. So we put off the old manner of living, the way the Gentiles live, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. The, the thing that makes lust deceitful is that lust desires promise so much, but they deliver nothing. They promise fulfillment but they don't produce. It only creates an emptiness. A person who gives himself over to his lust only finds that the lust grows and he desires more and more and more in order to get the same degree of excitement. But there's never a place of fulfillment. Lust only grows, the deceitful lust. And so that's a part of the old man, but we are to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. That's the new man. Renewed in the spirit of my mind. My mind is not governed or ruled by my fleshly desires any longer, but ruled by the spirit of God. Paul uh, talking uh, to the a church in Rome said, I beg you, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies unto God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. It makes sense. And don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man. So you put off the old nature, the old man. And you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. As we sang tonight, we choose the fear of the Lord. For the fear of the Lord is to hate all evil. We choose the fear of the Lord. The new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away, now we put away the old man. So he's going to contrast here the old man with the new man. Wherefore, putting away lying. Speak every man the truth with his neighbor. Lying is a part of the old nature. Speaking the, the truth is a part of the new nature. And why are we to speak the truth? Because we are members of another. You don't want to lie to yourself. And, and we're members of each other. So we are to speak the truth because we are part of each other. Be ye angry and sin not, or don't let your anger lead you to sin. Now, we can become angry uh, quite easily because we're still in these bodies and we still have our old nature. And our old nature is warring against the new nature. The flesh is lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These two are contrary. We don't always do what we would. And so it's easy to get angry, but then immediately bring it under the Spirit. Put that off. Don't let your anger lead you to sin. And then don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Before you go to bed at night, get things settled. And especially husband and wife kind of things. Don't go to sleep before you get the issues resolved and there's forgiveness and there's a settling. Don't spend those restless nights waking up and thinking, oh, I hate him. <laughs> How could he do that and all? But, you know, get the issue said. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. 
neither give any place for the devil. The moment you give a place for the devil, the moment you give him a beachhead in your life, you can be sure he's going to try to expand that beachhead. Jesus said, the prince of this world cometh and he hath nothing in me. No beachheads. Don't let him have a beachhead in your life. Don't have that little area that you sort of coddle and say, well, you know, um, I have a right to feel angry and I have a right to get even. And, and you know, you've got that dirty closet where Satan still lives <laughs> and you've allowed him that place. No, no. Now Paul goes on to say, let him that stole, steal no more. That's good. That's negative though. If you have been a thief, don't be a thief anymore. If you've stolen, don't steal anymore. That's fine. But Paul goes on to the positive. You know, that's the old man who steals, gets by with what he can. But rather... Rather than stealing, rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he might have to give to those who are in need, rather than taking. Work, so you'll be able to give to those that are in need. I like that. It isn't just a negative. Don't steal anymore. It's positive. Go out and get a job and help someone who's in need so that you'll have to give to those that are in need. No, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Be careful of what you say. No corrupt or filthy communication come out of your mouth. Be careful of those four-letter words. They're totally unbecoming to a child of God. They're totally inappropriate for a child of God. Let no corrupt or filthy communication proceed out of your mouth. But again, the positive, rather than the filthy communication coming out of your mouth, the positive side, but that which is good to the use of building up that it might minister grace to the hear hearers. You see, the Christian life isn't just a bunch of negatives. It's a bunch of positives. We don't do the negative, but it's, it's not enough just to be a negative. You know, well, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't go with girls who do. Well, uh, <laughs> you've got to have a positive side. And it's not that I just don't steal, but I'm giving, I'm working so I can give to those that are in need. It's not that I just don't use filthy language, but that my language builds people up. That my language ministers grace to people. It helps people. It builds them up. Ministers grace to the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Now what grieves the Holy Spirit of God? In verse 31, he said, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. These are the things that grieve the Spirit of God. Bitterness. If you allow bitterness in your heart, that grieves the Spirit of God. If you allow wrath or anger to control you, that grieves the Spirit of God. If you are clamoring, that grieves the Spirit of God. Evil speaking grieves the Spirit of God. And malice grieves the Spirit of God. So grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you've been sealed to the day of redemption. In the uh, first chapter, Paul talks about how that God has sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest or down payment of the purchased possession 
until the redemption of the purchased possession. So God has purchased you. Jesus redeemed you with his blood from the old life, from the sinful life. He bought you. He redeemed you. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. You've, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. So having purchased you, he gave or he put on you his seal of ownership, which is the Holy Spirit, which is the earnest or down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. You are his purchased possession. One day he's going to claim you. He's going to take you out of this world. He said, they're mine. I purchased them. They belong to me. And he's going to claim that which is his. And he will redeem his purchased possession. That is, he'll take possession of us. So the Holy Spirit is the seal that I belong to God. And then verse 32, and this sort of just sums up the whole issue. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. This is, this is the bottom line. Be kind, be tender hearted, not hard hearted tender-hearted, forgiving one another. To what extent? Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That's the measure. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. It's interesting that when Jesus taught on forgiveness, he usually used as a... Uh, example of contrast how much God has forgiven us such a great debt and what little debts we hold against our brother the little things that I get upset about and say I'll never forgive them look what they did to me <laughs> and they're minor little things They're such minor little things. As James said, behold, what a great fire such a little matter kindles. And then isn't it interesting when you've been in this big, big fight and you go back, where did it all start? Well, he said something I didn't like. He said, I didn't look good. <laughs> and that can, that can just flare up into a huge fire. Big fight. Little things. Be kind. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. That's the new man. Put off the old man, all of the corruption. Put on the new man, which is created in Christ Jesus. And allow God's spirit to work in us as he conforms us into the image of Christ. As we move into chapter 5 next week, look over carefully how we are to walk in love and what Paul actually defines as walking in love both from a negative and a positive standpoint what it is to walk in love and then the encouragement to walk circumspectly and uh, then we get into the family relationships next week also as we walk in relationship to our husbands and to our wives and to our children so uh, a lot of valuable teaching in chapter 5. Study it over carefully. Read it over it. Pray over it. Ask God to just work these things out in your heart 
and in your life as we go through the book of Ephesians. Father, we thank you for what you have done for us and what you are doing for us. And now, Lord, help us that we might walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we've been called. Help us, Lord, that we would not walk as the world. But, Lord, may we be renewed by your Spirit. And may we walk after the Spirit and the things that build up the body of Christ. Oh, Lord, help us that we will be tender-hearted, forgiving one another. We thank you, Lord, that you've forgiven us. Bless us, Lord, and help us, Lord, that we might be everything you would have us to be. Help us to find our place of service in the body. Help us, Lord, to fit into that place where you've called us. And help us to function, Lord, with the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask to be like him all through life's journey. From earth to glory, all I ask to be like him, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask to be like him. All through life's journey, from earth to glory, all I ask to be like him. God bless you.